Welcome to Thursdays for the Soul. This will be a predictable time of gathering for something to feed your spirit, offered by faith, education, innovation, and formation of the United Church of Christ. I am Reverend Dr. Chris Davies, and I'm hosting this space this Thursday and in the Thursdays to follow. Today's offering is a tenebrae service of reflection and remembrance. We reflect this day on the full extent of Jesus Christ's love for his disciples then and for us today. On Monday, Thursday, we are commemorating the Last Supper and the Passion Story that follows Jesus' path to the cross as written in the Gospel of Matthew. T today, we have asked clergy from across the denomination to share their voices in this service events. And we are inviting you to join from wherever you are with elements of communion as you find them with what you already have. We, the United Church of Christ, are a denomination of firsts. We are an innovative denomination. We are a denomination that believes that God is still speaking, even at times beyond our capacity to understand. I implore you to have communion in ways that are intentional, connective, and even digital. The divine is bigger than our rituals, bigger than the rules we set for ourselves, and even bigger than our capacity to hold faith. And in times where we need to be connected more than ever, and when the only way to do, to do so and to have communion is digitally, then so be it. Gather your household, gather your elements, and give thanks. Gather your energy, gather your faith, and reach towards the ancestors who knew of times harder than this time. Gather your breath, gather your being, and pour spirit into all that is before us, blessing and calling God to attend and remembering Christ. Gather for communion and know, however it is that you are able to partake this day, I want you to take time here to, I want to take time here to say that in the United Church of Christ, we welcome any and all who are hungry for the love of Christ, no matter where you are on Christ's, on life's journey. And as we begin this journey together, we light our candles from the, the Christ candle, each a symbol of the disciples at the Last Supper. As each passage is read, a candle will be extinguished to represent the way each disciple deserted Jesus in the last moments before his death. Welcome to this table. This table that there is nothing you could do to earn a place at this table and there's nothing that you could do to be disinvited from this table. This table was created and curated with you in mind before the foundation of the world, uniquely for you. On the night that Jesus was arrested, Jesus was with his friends. They were with one another, celebrating with one another, communing with each other. And on that night, Jesus took bread bread amongst his friends, and Jesus broke it. As Jesus was breaking that bread, I think he wanted us to have a symbol that Jesus will be bread for our journey. Jesus will be there with us every step along the way, even in the midst of a struggle, even in the midst of the concerns in which we have, we would be nourished. On the same night, Jesus took a cup and he poured this cup, this cup that it might be a symbol, a symbol of renewal, a symbol of life, a cup of blessing. Jesus was reminding us that I will pour from a well within you, my friend, that will never run dry. As you take a moment, if you're able to find whatever will be your symbol of bread, 
whether it's literal bread or a cracker or an Oreo or whatever you have, know that the embodiment of God with us and the communing of all of us one together all over this country and the world, that Christ is with you. I invite you now to take of this bread and to eat it. In the same manner, I invite you to take up your cup. Again, no matter what it is, know that this cup of blessing, this cup of renewal, this cup inviting each of us into a deeper communion with one another is poured for you. And I invite you to take this cup and drink. Greater of all things, bless this bread and this cup that has so nourished each of us, no matter where we are. Whether we may feel alone, remind us that we are never lonely. Remind us that you are with us in every iteration of our being. You are with us exactly as you've created us to be. Many of us, as we close this ritual, we offer the prayer that Jesus taught us. In this moment, I invite you to pray as you feel led, using words that make sense to you, using words that make this moment, this communion that is available to each and every one of us unique to you. Make it come alive that you may feel the presence and the power of a living and an alive God. I will be offering an inclusive version of the Lord's Prayer written by Richard McCall. Close your eyes, pray along with me, or add your own words. Blessed one, our father, our mother, our parent, holy is your name. May your love be enacted in the world. May your will be done on earth and in heaven. Give us today our daily bread on, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Save us in the time of trial and tribulation and deliver us from all forms of evil and struggle. For all that we do, we do in your love and all that your love brings to birth. And the fullness of love that will be are ours and yours now and forever. Amen and Ashe. From the Gospel of Matthew. Then Jesus told them, before the night is over, you are going to fall to pieces because of what happens to me. There is a scripture that says, I'll strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I, your shepherd, will go ahead of you, leading the way to Galilee. Peter broke in. Even if everyone else falls to pieces on account of you, I won't. Don't be so sure, Jesus said. This very night, before the rooster crows up the dawn, you will deny me three times. Peter protested. Even if I had to die with you, I would never deny you. All the others said the same thing. Then Jesus went with them to a garden called Gethsemane and told his disciples, stay here while I go over there and pray. Taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he plunged into an agonizing sorrow. Then he said, this sorrow is crushing my life out. Stay here and keep vigil with me. Going a little ahead, he fell on his face, praying, Abba, if there is any way, get me out of this, but please not what I want. You do, you do what you want. When he came back to his disciples, he found them sound asleep. He said to Peter, can't you stick it out with me even a single hour? 
stay alert, be in prayer so you don't wander into temptation without even knowing you're in danger. There's a part of you that is eager, ready for anything in God, but there's another part that's as lazy as an old dog sleeping by the fire. He then left them a second time. Again, he prayed, Abba, if there is no other way than this, drinking this cup to the dregs, I'm ready. Do it your way. When he came back, he again found them sound asleep. They simply couldn't keep their eyes open. This time, he let them sleep on and went back a third time to pray, going over the same ground one last time. When he came back the next time, he said, are you going to sleep on and make a night of it? My time is up. The human one is about to be handed over to the hands of sinners. Get up, let's get going. My betrayer is here. The words were barely out of his mouth when Judas, the one from the 12, showed up. And with him, a gang from the high priests and religious leaders, brandishing swords and clubs. The betrayer had worked out a sign with them. The one I kissed, that's the one, seized him. He went straight to Jesus, greeted him, how are you, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said, friend, why this charade? Then they came on him, grabbed him, and roughed him up. One of those with Jesus pulled his sword and, taking a swing at the chief priest's servant, cut off his ear. Jesus said, put your sword back where it belongs. All who use swords are destroyed by swords. Don't you realize that I am able right now to call to my father and 12 companies more if I want them of fighting angels would be here, battle ready. But if I did that, how would the scriptures come true that say this is the way it has to be? The high priests conspiring with the council tried to cook up charges against Jesus in order to sentence him to death. But even though many stepped up, making one false accusation after another, nothing was believable. Finally, two men came forward with this. He said, I can tear down this temple of God and after three days build it. The chief priest stood up and said, what do you have to say to this accusation? Jesus kept silent. Then the chief priest said, I command you by the authority of the living God to say if you are the Messiah, the son of God. Jesus was curt. You yourself said it. And that's not all. Soon you'll see it for yourself, the human one seated at the right hand of the mighty one, arriving on the clouds of heaven. At that, the chief priest lost his temper, ripping his robes, yelling, he blasphemed. Why do we need witnesses to accuse him? You all heard him blaspheme. Are you going to stand for such blasphemy? They all said, death, that seals his death sentence. Then they were spitting in his face and banging him around. They jeered as they slapped him, prophesy, Messiah, who hit you that time? All this time, Peter was sitting out in the courtyard one of the servant girls came up to him and said, you were with Jesus, the Galilean. In front of everybody there, he denied it. I don't know what you're talking about. 
As he moved over toward the gate, someone else said to the people there, this man was with Jesus the Nazarene. And again, he denied it, salting his denial with an oath. I swear I never laid eyes on the man. Shortly after that, some bystanders approached Peter. You've got to be one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he got really nervous and swore, I don't know the man. Just then a rooster crowed. Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter went out and cried and cried and cried. In the first light of dawn, all the high priests and the religious leaders met up and put the finishing touches on their plot to kill Jesus. Then they tied him up and paraded him to Pilate, the governor. Jesus was placed before the governor who questioned him. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, if you say so. But when the accusations rained down hot and heavy from the high priests and religious leaders, he said nothing. Pilate asked him, do you hear that long list of accusations? Aren't you going to say something? And Jesus kept silence, not a word from his mouth. The governor was impressed, really impressed. Pilate asked, then what do I do with Jesus, the so-called Christ? They all shouted, nail him to a cross. He objected, but for what crime? But they yelled all the louder, nail him to a cross. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere and that a riot was imminent, he took a basin of water and washed his hands in full sight of the crowd saying, I am washing my hands of responsibility for this man's death. From now on, it's in your hands. You are judge and jury. The soldiers assigned to the governor took Jesus into the governor's palace and got the entire brigade together for some sick fun. They stripped him and dressed him in a red toga. They plaited a crown from branches of a thorn bush and set it on his head. They put a stick in his right hand for a scepter. Then they knelt before him in a mocking reverence. Bravo, King of the Jews, they said, bravo. Then they spit on him and hit him on the head with a stick. When they had their fun, they took off the toga and put his own clothes back on him. Then they proceeded out to the crucifixion. From noon to three, the whole earth was dark. Around mid-afternoon, Jesus groaned out of the depths, crying loudly, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some bystanders who heard him said he's calling for Elijah. One of them ran and got a sponge soaked in sour wine and lifted it on a stick so he could drink. The others joked, don't be in such a hurry. Let's see if Elijah comes and saves him. But Jesus, again, crying out loudly, breathed his last. At that moment, the temple curtain was ripped in two, top to bottom. There was an earthquake and rocks were split into pieces. <sighs> Late in the afternoon, 
a wealthy man from Arimathea, a disciple of Jesus, arrived. His name was Joseph. He went to Pilate and asked for Jesus's body. Pilate granted his request. Joseph took the body and wrapped it in clean linens, put it in his own tomb, a new tomb only recently cut into the rock and rolled a large stone across the entrance. Then he went off. But Mary Magdalene and the other Mary stayed, sitting in plain view of the tomb. Let us pray. Holy one, you have fed us out of your generous and gracious hands. From them, we have received welcome, nourishment, hope, and consolation. May these things grow in us alongside the gift of faith so that we plant their seeds in the world around us. Through the Holy Spirit, guide us in these days and weeks ahead to remember our pace in your great and ongoing story of resurrection and restoration. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Be blessed into your evenings. <laughs>